Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about inertial and non-inertial frames of reference, starting off with some theory and then going into problem solving. So what's a frame of reference? This is something we went over briefly in the relative motion chapter, which was 1.6, but a frame of reference is a coordinate system relative to which motion is described or observed. There's two main types of frames of reference, so it can be inertial or non-inertial. An inertial frame of reference is a frame of reference in which the law of inertia holds true, again, also known as Newton's first law. All inertial frames of reference are equally valid. An example of an inertial frame of reference is a bus moving at constant velocity, since the net force is equal to zero. For a non-inertial frame of reference, this is a frame of reference that accelerates relative to an inertial frame of reference. I'm going to provide a few examples of this. So first example, a bus accelerates in the forward direction. If there was a ball sitting on the floor of the bus, the ball would roll backwards due to the forwards acceleration of the bus. A second example is a bus accelerating in the negative direction. So this would be in the backwards direction, which is also known as deceleration. That same ball on the bus floor would in this case roll forwards. Another example is a bus turning a corner. So obviously the bus experiences an acceleration because there's either a direction change, a velocity change, or both. So a ball on the bus floor rolls in the opposite direction as that of the turn. So if the bus were to make a sharp turn to the right, the ball would roll to the left. In all three of these cases that I just presented, there appears to be a net force acting on the ball. So from the frame of reference of the bus, this is the result of a fictitious force. From the frame of reference of an observer on the ground, however, they would say that this is the result of the law of inertia. So a fictitious force is a force that explains the motion observed in a non-inertial frame of reference. These are apparent forces, but they're non-existent in real life. The last definition is apparent weight, which is the magnitude of the normal force acting on an object in a non-inertial frame of reference. An example of an inertial frame of reference is when the elevator is moving at constant velocity. In this case, a person that's standing, their normal force would just be equal to their weight, which is mg. However, if the elevator was accelerating or decelerating, it'd then be a non-inertial frame of reference. The normal force of the person would either be greater than their weight when the elevator is accelerating upwards, or the normal force would appear to be less than the weight. So this is when the elevator is decelerating. Applying this theory to some problem solving, let's start off with a simple example. So we're going to the section 3.1 questions from the Nelson textbook. I'll go over a few questions, so page 113, number 2, 5, 7, and 8. Starting off with number 2, a mass on a string is suspended from the ceiling of an airplane. Calculate the angle that the mass makes when the airplane has a horizontal acceleration of magnitude 1.5 meter per second squared. So we know the acceleration and we are solving for theta. We're letting upwards and forwards be positive, and we're drawing the free body diagram first. So in this problem, there's only two forces acting, which are tension, which is at an angle, and then gravitational force straight downwards. Since the airplane has a horizontal acceleration, we're assuming this is to the right, since I let upwards and rightwards represent the forwards direction and positive. Since I've let the rightwards direction represent the forward, you'll note that the tension force is at a diagonal in the rightwards forwards direction with that angle theta that we're solving for. Because again, when you accelerate forward from a non-inertial frame of reference point of view, the mass on the string would appear to be diagonally backwards. Since we're dealing with acceleration, we know that we'll be solving in the x component. However, since we don't know what tension is equal to, we can actually use the y component to solve for this since we know there's no acceleration in the y component. So in the y component, 0 is equal to the y component of tension minus the gravitational force. Isolating for tension, since we know that the y component of tension is related through cos theta since that's the adjacent side relative to theta. Ft is equal to mg over cos theta. Subbing that tension force that we solved for into the equation for the net force in the x component, ma is equal to Ft sine theta since the x component is the opposite side. When you do that, you get ma is equal to mg sine theta over cos theta. We know that sine over cos theta is tan theta, canceling those masses out since that variable appears on both sides, and then isolating for theta, we get that theta is equal to the inverse tan acceleration over gravity. Thus, that theta is 8.7 degrees, which is the angle that the mass makes when the airplane has that acceleration of 1.5 meter per second squared. 
For question number five, the passenger elevators at the Brookfield Place Towers in Toronto reach a top speed of six meters per second upwards. Suppose one of the elevators reaches this speed in 10 seconds. Calculate the apparent weight of a passenger whose mass is 64 kilograms. So we know that the initial speed is zero, final speed is six meters per second, and change in time is 10 seconds. We also know the mass of the passenger, and we're solving for normal force since this is what apparent weight represents. We have three variables that relate to kinematics, so we know we can use one of the big five equations. Acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. We can just plug in the speeds that we were given and the time, which are all scalar quantities. We know that the elevator starts at rest, so we can just cancel that initial speed. So that acceleration is equal to the final speed over change in time, which is 0.60 meter per second squared. Applying this acceleration to forces, since we know that Newton's second law is F equals MA, we're working the Y component since there's no X component forces. So MA is equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force. When isolating for the normal force, you get M times acceleration plus gravity. Note that we're subbing in only the magnitudes here and no negative signs since we already took that into account by letting upwards be positive. So the normal force that we solve for is 665.6 newtons, which just rounds to 6.7 times 10 to the 2 newtons. For question number 7, a vintage sports car accelerates down a hill at an angle of 17 degrees to the ground, as shown. The driver notices that the string of ornamental fuzzy dice hanging from his rearview mirror is perpendicular to the roof of the car. Part A asks us to draw a free body diagram of the dice from the frame of reference of the level ground, both when the car is at rest on the hill and when it's accelerating. Explain how the two free body diagrams differ. So first of all, the free body diagram of the dice when the car is at rest. The dice is actually aligned with the vertical with respect to the level ground, whereas the dice makes an angle of theta with respect to the normal force. If you refer to the car free body diagram, you'll note that theta is that angle between tension force and normal force, whereas in the free body diagram of the dice, when the car's acceleration does not equal zero. So remember that when you're accelerating forward, because the dice maintains its state of rest, it would appear to be in the backwards diagonal direction, which is why tension is diagonally in that manner. So in this case, there appears to be a horizontal fictitious force, which aligns the dice with the normal force, as you'll note that they have the same theta value with respect to the vertical. The dice in this case makes an angle theta with respect to the level ground. In order to calculate the car's acceleration, which is asked of us in part B, you would use the car's free body diagram in order to solve that. Using that problem-solving tip of rotating the reference frame, you would get the normal force to be acting in the upwards direction and then gravitational force to be diagonal, letting upwards and forwards be positive to the left. We know that we're working with the x component since we're working with acceleration. F is equal to ma, so ma is equal to the x component of the gravitational force, canceling mass since the variable appears on both sides. Acceleration is equal to g sine theta. Plugging those numbers in, we get acceleration to be 2.9 meter per second squared down the incline. Lastly, question number eight. It says that mass one does not slide with respect to the surface when the horizontal force shown is applied. Determine the magnitude of the horizontal force in both figure 7a and 7b. Assume no friction. So in part a of this question, we know mass one to be 1.8 kilograms, mass two to be 1.2 kilograms, mass three to be three kilograms, and we're solving for applied force. Since mass 1 doesn't slide with respect to the surface, we know that the acceleration of the system must equal to the acceleration of mass 1. So the only free body diagrams we need here are really the free body diagram of the system and then the free body diagram of mass 1 and mass 2. So in the free body diagram of mass 1, you'll note that there's three forces acting on it, the normal force, the tension force, and the gravitational force. And since we're working with the horizontal direction, Fx is just equal to the tension force. M1A is equal to the tension force, isolating for acceleration, FT over M1 is the acceleration of mass 1. Since we don't know what that tension force is, that's where the free body diagram of mass 2 comes in. So since it's a hanging mass, we can let the net force in the Y component equal to 0. 0 is equal to the tension force minus the gravitational force on mass 2, which is just M2G. Isolating for the tension force, tension is just equal to M2G. For the free body diagram of the system, we know that the only net force acting on it is actually the applied force in the x component. In this case, 
the total mass times the acceleration is equal to the applied force. Isolating for acceleration, it's equal to applied force over m1 plus m2 plus m3. As we stated previously, the acceleration of the system should be equal to the acceleration of mass 1. So we're letting those two equations equal each other since they experience the same acceleration. So m2g, which is the tension force over m1, is equal to applied force over the sum of the masses. Isolating for applied force, we get that the applied force is 39 newtons in the forward direction. For part b, applying the same concepts, except this time with different numbers and a different scenario. So mass 1 is equal to 1.2 kilograms, mass 2 is equal to 2.8 kilograms. We know theta of the ramp is 25 degrees and we're solving for applied force. In this case, the acceleration of mass 1 is still equal to the acceleration of the system since it doesn't slide with respect to the surface. Letting upwards and forwards be positive once again, we're drawing the free body diagram of mass 1 and then the free body diagram of the system. For mass 1, we're working in the x component, so fx is equal to the gravitational force's x component on mass 1. m1a is equal to m1g sine theta since that's the opposite side cancelling mass out on both sides, and then acceleration is equal to g sine theta. For our second equation, we're using the free body diagram of the system, again working in the x component. So the only force acting in the x component is the applied force. So the net force in the x component is equal to m1 plus m2 times acceleration. Isolating for acceleration, that's equal to applied force over m1 plus m2, letting equation 1 and equation 2 equal each other. G sine theta is equal to applied force over m1 plus m2. Therefore, applied force is 17 newtons forward direction. The last question I have here is a test question that I had on one of my unit tests. So let's say a physics student has an air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror of her car. When she has to make a quick stop, she notices that the air freshener is pointing towards the front of the car. So I let upwards and forwards be positive. You'll note that her acceleration would be in the negative direction since she's decelerating. So part A asks us to draw the free body diagram of the air freshener in the frame of reference of the road versus the frame of reference of the car. So from the road, we know this is an inertial frame of reference since the law of inertia applies. And we know that from the road frame of reference, there's no acceleration. Since the car is decelerating, we would expect the air freshener to point in the forwards direction, which was actually given to us in the question. So the tension force is diagonally to the right, and then obviously gravitational force is acting in the downwards direction. This is actually the same free body diagram as that of the frame of reference of the car. However, in the car point of view, this is a non-inertial frame of reference since the car is experiencing an acceleration. So obviously the law of inertia does not hold true in this case. So although the free body diagrams were the same, there's of course differences in the way we explain the free body diagram. So in point form in part B, it asks to discuss the difference between the two free body diagrams. Use the terms inertial and non-inertial frame of reference in your answer. So from the frame of reference of the road, this is an inertial frame of reference since the road is obviously stationary and the net force is equal to zero, thus the law of inertia holds true. The car has an acceleration in the negative direction, assuming forwards is positive, as I mentioned before. The air freshener is pointing towards the front of the car due to inertia in an inertial reference frame. The reason why the air freshener is pointing towards the front of the car is because it resists changes in motion. It maintains its state of velocity in which it continues to travel with the same velocity in the forward direction even when the car starts decelerating, thus ends up pointing towards the front of the car. On the other hand, from the frame of reference of the car, this is a non-inertial frame of reference since there is a net force. Again, the car has that acceleration in the negative direction, assuming forwards is positive. The air freshener points towards the front of the car due to a fictitious force. So in this case, from the frame of reference of the car, there appears to be an applied force which pushes the air freshener forwards. That wraps it up for this video. Stay tuned for next time to learn about uniform circular motion.